Impact of Influence, the tragic story of a powerful South Carolina family and the mysterious deaths that they are linked to. Hello, friend. I am Matt Harris. Seton Tucker is here as well as we are so happy again to have you listening and always appreciating your thoughts on the podcast and always trying to get better. Grateful for every listener in this episode. We're going to take a little dive into the June 7th double homicides of Maggie and Paul Murdoch and the days after that murder. We're also going to take in some listener emails and Facebook comments. Speaking of that, the Facebook page, Seton. It is Murdoch Podcast, and also our website is MurdochPodcast.com. So we'll also talk about some of the theories that people have sent us. And we're going to talk to a weapons expert. Yes, because there were some questions from a couple episodes ago when we had the former FBI agent, Bobby Jacone on. We wanted to follow up on some information and questions that you guys sent us. Yes, we had a lot of questions about weapons and ammo, so we thought it was a great time to bring an expert on. And also, you were able to speak with Alec Murdoch's brother, John Marvin. And as we go through this timeline a little bit, you will be telling people some of the things that John Marvin told you that dispute some of the things that have been reported, others support some of the things that have been reported. So one of the things that has been disputed over the last year is what Paul was doing the day of his murders. So we reached out to John Marvin to see what he had to say, and we'll get to that later on in this episode. Okay, do you want to begin with the actual murders and work, work our way back? Yes, so okay. let's talk about June 7th. So we know that Maggie and Paul's death, time of death, was ruled between 9 and 9.30. One of the questions that we received was, is it possible that they were killed at different times? And we know that Paul's death certificate has been made public, but Maggie's has not been released. Mm -hmm. But all of the reports say 9 to 9.30. Right. We know the time based on Paul's death certificate, but we don't have Maggie's death certificate. So that's a question of mine is, why don't we have her certificate? Yes, and why Paul's not Maggie's, right? Right. There's got to be something in there that law enforcement feels is crucial to the investigation not to release her death certificate. And that 9 to 9.30 is a really tiny window. So there was, there was some, and we're all assuming uh, that they were killed at close to the same time. It'd be surprising if they weren't. So at 10.07, Alec calls 911 to report the shootings of Maggie and Paul. So that is a 37-minute window from the latest that they could have been killed till Alec makes the call. And we got to assume a few minutes to drive down the, the driveway. And that's something that we should mention because people have been wondering about the fact that he saw the bodies. Now, there's two entrances into the Moselle property. The one seems more used than the other as far as like tire tracks and whatnot. We were there. The mailbox is there. And that is the driveway that would lead you to the dog kennels and the home and uh, perhaps obviously seeing the bodies before you would get to the home, although it was dark. Right. Okay. So on our episode 53, where we spoke to former FBI agent Bobby Chacon, he said that it was his opinion if the reports that came out by Fitz News are true, that Ellick was in close proximity to one of the victims when they were shot. Because of the... High velocity impact spatter. Right, which he says is at the most three feet. Right. So that in general. is inconsistent with what I think Alec has told police is that he was not there. He calls nine one one. Or I don't know what he's told police, but we know based on the nine one one call that we have another episode, but we kind of did a dive into that. Um that he was He it, came upon the bodies. He came upon the bodies. He, he when he tells nine one one. Right. He's not saying he was there when one of the People were shot. And one of the questions that we have, don't have an answer to yet is if the high impact velocity spatter was on Alex's shirt, you would have to think that maybe being on his pants and shoes, et cetera. We don't know that it wasn't. We only know that it's been leaked that it was on his shirt. Right. It could have been on the other things. It we could have been on the other things, but that has been a question that we've received from a lot of people. Yeah. And I have that question in my mind too. So I emailed Bobby Chacon, and this is his answer. He says, where the spatter ends up is a function of several things, including the angle from which the shot is taken. 
is the shooter in an elevated shooting position, for example. The position the victim is in when the impact occurs, the relative position to the victim of the person getting the spatter on them, and where on the body the impact occurs. A headshot will produce more spatter than a shot to the body due to the skull shattering, and clothes often on the body can absorb the spatter. The spatter is mostly a fine pink mist that moves very quickly for a very short distance, then dissipates. So he is saying that. All these factors combined, it is possible that someone could only have the spatter on their shirt. Hmm, Interesting. So we know Colleton County Sheriff's Department was dispatched, and they confirmed that they found two bodies that were shot multiple times. Then at 1028, Colleton County Sheriff's Department contacted SLED for their help with the investigation. And at 1146, SLED agents arrived on scene. And we know crime scene investigations collected and submitted various items into the night and the next morning, which were sent to the state police forensic lab for investigation, and perhaps other labs we're hearing now that there might have been other labs involved. No results uh, have been made available to the public, just a few leaks here and there. Now, Alec, according to Wall Street Journal, where did he say he was? So Alec says he was visiting his father at the hospital the day of the murders, and then he returned home to Moselle to take a nap. Then he left Moselle and went to his parents' home in Barnville to check on his mother, who suffers from dementia. I guess she has around-the-clock care. Um, He claims he did not see Maggie or Paul while he was at Moselle. And the drive from Moselle to Barnville is, you know, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. Now, you talk to Alec's brother, John Marvin. He is not the attorney brother. He is a rental equipment rental uh, business. And what did he tell you about that day, the June 7th day? Right. So we did reach out to him just specifically about Paul's actions on that day. And he did confirm that Paul had been working for him in his heavy equipment business that summer. And his business is located in Bluffton, South Carolina. And Paul did work with him the day of his murder. So according to John Marvin, Paul kind of split his time between Moselle and John Marvin's house. John Marvin's house was only approximately 10 minutes away from where his business located was located. So some days it just made more sense for him to stay there. But he would go back to Moselle when he had stuff to do. He used the example of getting the dove fields ready was an example he used. Of, you know, if he had stuff to do at Moselle, mm-hmm. he would go back. Um, And I asked him about how much of the time he spent at Moselle and how much of the time he spent at his home. And he he said probably about 50-50. Now, another thing, while we're on the subject of Paul, Eric Bland was on the Shrimp Tank podcast, Charleston, and said that Paul was under house arrest. Did you ask him whether Paul was under house arrest? I did. And he said that Paul was not under house arrest. And if he was, they would have had to ignore it because if he was working at John Marvin's place and going back and forth, it wouldn't, you wouldn't think he'd be under house arrest unless, he, unless the bracelet didn't go off. So that makes sense to me. Well, and sometimes I think you're allowed, if you're under house arrest, you can go to work yeah. at different places, but I don't think you can spend the right. night so in other locations. He says he wasn't. The next thing we want to talk about is the fact that you talked to John Marvin about John Marvin and Alec and Randy's father, Randolph, who was having some medical issues. And John Marvin picked up Randolph? Yeah, so John Marvin told me that he received a call from Randy, his brother, telling him that their father needed to go to the hospital in Savannah. This isn't really that surprising, considering he died a few days later. By the way, that that drive is about an hour and eight minutes. And this was news to me because I had assumed... I don't know why, that Randolph had been in the hospital. I didn't realize this was the first day that he just, that John Marvin took him that day. Right. So John Marvin said he drove to his parents' home in Barnville to pick up his father and take him to the hospital. Um, And according to John Marvin, he says he took his mother's vehicle uh, to drive the father to the hospital. In Savannah. In Savannah. And that he leave his, and John Marvin, I believe, left his work truck at the Barnville house, right? Right. So he said that he actually asked Paul to go pick up his truck 
because he was headed back to Moselle, and Varnville and Moselle are in close proximity, and he wanted Paul to drive his vehicle back to Bluffton, where the business was the next day. Oh, so the next day, he would have... Paul would have driven John Marvin's truck to work. Right, just to save him, back a, to him. Right, to save him the gotcha. trip of having to go to Barnville to pick up the truck. Well, that, was a, that, that has been a, a question that all along is, did Maggie and Paul drive separately to Moselle? Now we know that it appears they did because John uh, Marvin's truck was there driven by Paul. Right. So, and, and another thing he said, there were also some reports that they had a family dinner and John Marvin said, you know, they do very physical work at his business. Paul would not have been, you know, fit to have a family dinner, said he may have gotten a snack or something like that. But it was his understanding that Paul had plans to go back to Moselle to have dinner with Maggie. And he wasn't sure if Maggie prepared the dinner or Block prepared the dinner. But that's what he had in his mind was that Paul was definitely headed back to Moselle. And speaking of Moselle and Maggie, there's been all kinds of stories about where Maggie spent her time because they have the place in Edista, which... They've just sold for cash. Did he say whether Maggie was living at Moselle or at the Edisto property? I mean, he indicated that she was living at Moselle. I mean, I think she would spend time at Edisto. I know she had pre- she'd been remodeling it, and it's summer, so you would think it would make sense. You have a house on Edisto. You would want to spend time there. But he didn't, indi- he didn't indicate to me that he believed that she was living in Edisto full-time. Okay. But it was on her Facebook, you know, it said that she was living in Edisto, but maybe sounds she was to him, time. Sounds to me like he was saying that she was bouncing back and forth. No, I also did ask him because there were some reports and rumors that Paul received a call to go check on some dogs at Moselle. Um, and John Marvin says he does not have any information about whether Paul received a call like that. Hmm. Now let's move to the day after the murders, June 8th. 9.20 in the morning, SLED spokesperson Tommy Crosby releases a statement that says, based on evidence, they don't believe there's a danger to the public, which has always struck a, an odd chord with everybody. Uh, and then later in the day, the Island Packet reports that Maggie's phone was alongside the roadside near Mazelle's, and Paul's phone was found near his body. And in a previous episode, we tell you John Marvin's version of, of finding Maggie's phone, right? Yep. Okay. Now, also, uh, we find out that day that a 2021 black Chevy Suburban registered to Alex's former law firm, well, law firm at the time, PMPED, was towed from the scene. That's from the Island Packet. John Marvin confirmed, what about vehicles? Well, we just talked about Paul's whereabouts on the day of his murder, and he says that John Marvin asked Paul to take his pickup truck to Moselle and drive it back to him the next day. So John Marvin did confirm with me that his pickup truck was one of the vehicles at the scene. Jumping ahead to June 10th, autopsies performed at MUSC. One of the things we have always talked about that found interesting is that Alec was scheduled to appear in court and find out and they were going to rule whether or not he needed to disclose his financial assets. This is all part of the 2019 boating crash where Mallory Beach was killed. So that's three days after the murders. Let's see. What do we have next? What date are we going to? Uh, let's, let's talk about June 16th. Uh, Fitz News reported that SLED was collecting evidence near Sockahatchee River. So that is very curious to me. Was anything found during that search? The next day, there's the Good Morning America interview with John Marvin and Randy. and. In that interview, they say Paul had been threatened multiple times by strangers. Right. I, I thought that that was really interesting. And they said that they didn't believe the threats were credible. Mm-hmm. So another thing in that interview that they said was that all of the occupants of the boating accident where Mallory Beach was killed voluntarily submitted DNA. And so did Alec. Now, the next day, June 18th, the state paper reports that SLED investigators searched Paul's off-campus apartment of USC, University of South Carolina, where he had been living the spring before his death. And there was a story that said his door was open right. when they went there, the door to the, the apartment. And it, we don't know. There haven't been any sort of reports of what was found, if anything, during mm-hmm. the investigation of 
or during the search of his apartment. So let's talk about the weapons now and the weapons that were used have been reported to be an AR-15 and a shotgun. And we're going to dive deeper into that with our guest, Tom McHale. He's currently the editor of American Handgunner, DIY Guns, Surplus Military and Classic Firearms, and a few more magazines. He's a South Carolina resident. He's published seven books to date, including The Practical Guide to Reloading Ammunition. And his most recent book is The Practical Guide to the United States Constitution. He's worked for 25 years in the technology industry and a graduate of Emory University. He is Tom McHale. Uh, hello, Tom. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thanks hello. for having me. All right, Seton, you want to, uh, I was going to say fire away. That would be yeah. too uh, yeah. ironic or weird. Don't say fire away. Um, no. <laughs> we've gotten a lot of questions from listeners. We had a former FBI agent on our episode 52, so we thought it would be a great time to reach out to an expert. So I I want to start with some of the basics. Can you tell us what an AR-15 is? Sure. Uh, that's a very big question. <laughs> so yeah. I'm going to start with the basics and uh, and we can move on from there. An AR-15 is uh, primarily a rifle. There are some versions that are technically classified as pistols. But the the big distinguishing factor of an AR-15 is, is uh, it's what we would refer to as a platform meaning it's somewhat of a de facto standard in terms of parts and calibers and, and things of that nature. So lots of companies make compatible components and add-ons and gizmos and ammo and all that for AR-15s. Would it be common to have an AR-15 at a hunting property? Oh, absolutely. It's the uh, most common rifle in America right now. I think no one really knows for sure, but... Uh, uh, there are tens of millions of AR-15s in circulation, and lots of people use them for hunting. Is it more common to use an AR-15 for hunting or a shotgun? All depends on the type of hunting. You know, while there are always exceptions, uh, shotguns are are great for moving targets, waterfowl, and things of that nature. Although some people do use shotguns with slugs or buckshot for uh, deer and other game. Um, so it really depends on the type of hunting. Well, I heard they hunt boar down there at a time, so the AR would be appropriate for that, right? Oh, absolutely. It's yeah. a, uh, a very popular in the, the uh, boar hunting world for lots of reasons. I mean, one of which is the, the caliber variability. You can get AR-type rifles in uh, a broad array of calibers, depending on what it is you want to do with it. Now, we are uh, clueless on how the old shotgun thing works here, so you're going to have to walk us through this. They said that buckshot and birdshot was used. Use that in, in each barrel has something different? Do they, do they reload and load? I mean, how, does, how do you think it works in this case? Well, it, think, of, um, think of options in terms of the ammunition you fire out of a shotgun. So uh, there, this is where we're going to get into... Uh, one of the potential causes for confusion in this issue is there are infinity variables in all this, right? So just uh, when somebody says birdshot, uh, that alone has a, a broad range of meanings. You know, there's birdshot where uh, a typical load will have almost 600 pellets, uh, but each pellet is well under, you know, a tenth of an inch in diameter. So really tiny pellets. There's birdshot that uh, has 90 pellets that might be, you know, 0.15 inches in diameter or so each. So and, and all sorts of stuff in between there. So uh, there, there are lots of definitions for birdshot. And the same thing goes for buckshot, too. You know, buckshot just generally refers to a shotgun load that has larger pellet sizes and few of them. You know, in, in a sense, uh, with, with buckshot, it's almost unusual to, to refer to them as pellets because in, in Typical classic, what they call double aught or two zero double zero buckshot. Um, we're talking pellets that are the size of thirty two caliber bullets, so they're, you know, over a third of an inch in, in diameter. One of the things that has been reported is about this blackout three hundred ammo. What what type of ammo is that? It's a uh, it is a a rifle cartridge. It's kind of an interesting one in that it has a, a huge range of performance attributes, and that's that's probably one of the reasons it's so popular. It's it is popular in AR-15 type rifles, but it's also used in traditional bolt action or other semi-automatic rifles uh, as well. 
But basically, it is a cartridge that's designed to fit in the same platform as what I would call standard AR-15 ammunition or, you know, 0.223 Remington or 5.56 millimeter ammunition. So they've designed it uh, using a cut down version of the case so that the case plus a larger diameter bullet still have that same overall length and can fit in the magazine of an AR-15 rifle. Of course, you need a larger barrel because it's a, a larger uh, diameter bullet in a 300 blackout. Um, but but that's the basic idea. They've come up with a cartridge that works in a relatively unmodified AR-15. You know, again, really the uh, the barrel is the only thing you have to change. Does this mean it's like a more accurate or or it has more power? That's probably uh, a dumb no, question. Not necessarily. <laughs> no, it's a, it's actually a great question, and this this is where the details really matter. Um, the the reason blackout has gotten so popular is that you can do all sorts of things with it. You can have a very big and very heavy bullet moving very slowly, uh, a subsonic version of a 300 blackout cartridge, uh, which has relatively low energy, but it's a big, heavy bullet. You know, uh, you can have a, a more traditional, I would say, rifle velocity version of, of a 300 blackout that moves much faster. So I wouldn't say more or less powerful. I would say different. So I, I would look at it as really more of an apples and oranges comparison. It's been reported that there was buckshot and birdshot used. And so we had a million questions about loading a shotgun with birdshot and buckshot. Is this done commonly? And some people are saying yes. Some people are saying no. So what is your thought on that? <laughs> I tell you, we gun people are awfully binary, aren't we? It's like, yes, yes <laughs> that always happens. No, that never happens. Right? So, uh I would definitely fall into the camp of it's not the least bit unusual to load a uh, shotgun like that. Uh, it it all depends on what you're going to use it for. You know, if um, uh, if you're hunting deer at, at longer range for a shotgun, at least you're going to use slugs. If you're hunting ducks, you're going to use birdshot. If you live in the country, you may use both. You know, um, I think I heard somebody say on the the uh, episode where you had the uh, uh, former FBI agent that, um, you know, People in rural areas will will often load a round or two of birdshot followed by something heavier. Uh, I don't find that the least bit unusual. You know, birdshot is great for dealing with poisonous snakes. As, as you know, we have a lot of those here in South Carolina. So it's yes. uh, I, I wouldn't consider that the least bit unusual. People even do that for defensive applications, too, for different, you know, different reasons. So. Yeah, I kind of wanted to talk about home defense. So I know I've read a great article that you wrote and someone, one of our listeners actually sent it to me. And that's how I tuned into finding you was, is birdshot effective for home defense? See, there you go with an unanswerable question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not going to cop out that easy. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'll, uh, I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, it can be great for home defense and it can be lousy for home defense. It all depends. So, you know, the first thing you'd look at is what is birdshot? You know, are you talking really tiny pellets? Are you talking a smaller number of larger pellets? And the reason that matters is the distance. So let's do this. Let's use a really uh, crazy and coarse analogy. Say I took uh, just a handful of glass marbles, you know, like kids used to play with a hundred years ago, right? You played models, mm -hmm. right? Um, you took that handful and you put them in a sock. So they were all held together and you, you whacked somebody with it. It's going to leave a serious mark, right? Because mm -hmm. at that point, you know, all held together like that, they're going to act like one giant marble more than a bunch of disparate marbles. Now, if I took that same handful of marbles and just held them in my hand and threw them at somebody 15 feet away, it's a whole different effect, Right. Mm -hmm. So, again, this is a rough and coarse analogy, but you kind of get a similar effect with a, a shotgun, especially in the birdshot category. So right when that, when those, say, 500 tiny, tiny pellets, you know, come out the barrel for, for number nine birdshot, uh, they're really one column, one packed together hunk of lead because they're all just mashed up against each other, right? But with every foot they travel forward, they start to spread out more and more and more. And at okay. some point... Um, you're really dealing with very small objects. They're moving fast, but they're very small and very light. So, you know, the amount of damage they're going to do uh, decreases very rapidly. Now, now, make no mistake, nobody wants to get shot with birdshot at, at any distance, right? 
Yeah. Uh, it's going to make a mess regardless. But I'm just trying to make the point that there is a world of difference of, of uh, somebody getting hit with that from two feet away versus 30 feet away. Gotcha. And if you, the further you are away, if I'm reading right or hear what you're saying, the further you are away, the less likely you are to be accurate into a, like if you just want to hit this little, you want to hit this little, this person, you're going to yeah. miss with some of those, the spread, the further they are away. Uh, not close, but not quite. Yeah. The spread, you know, that's kind of another shotgun myth. The, the spread in a shotgun, if we're talking about indoor or close distances, you know, 10, 20, 30 feet, uh, you still got aim because the, you know, we're only talking inches, you know, at, at right. 10 or 15 feet away, that spread is still only three, four or five inches. It, you know, it depends on, on the ammo and the gun and all of that, but it's small. Right. Now, when we're talking 30 yards away, it's a whole different story. If I'm standing next to a person and they want to hit the, and I'm the good guy and the bad guy standing next to me and you're, you know, whatever, however far away, would it be hard just to hit the bad guy? Uh, hard, meaning aiming wise? Yeah. There's, is there, there's yeah. no spread, material spread to speak of at, at really close distances like that. You've got to aim it just like you would a rifle or a or handgun. Another question we got was about how loud are shotguns and an AR-15? What is the distance that you could hear one of these weapons being discharged? All depends on the, the outdoor conditions, but they are very loud. So in the decibel arena, you know, rifles, that, to go in from memory, I think they're 160, 170, you know, decibels in noise. And to put that in perspective, uh, a Van Halen concert is, you know, 100 or 115 at its, at its loudest wow. peak. Now, now decibels are, they're not linear. So that 50% increase in decibels is orders of magnitudes louder in, in sound energy, right? So, yeah, so it's, it's noisy. Now, out in the country where there's trees and wind and cars and machinery and whatever else. And rain. Um, yeah, and rain. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, you know, all that tends to tends to dampen the noise a little bit. So, would you have to be a a good shot? Of guy breaks into your house and you've got the rifle and the buckshot or birdshot. Would you have to be skilled to hit that guy? Well, I guess the uh, the caveat here <laughs> in my current occupation, I'm always going to advocate for the more skilled, the better. Um, yeah. So I'll say that first, but. Um, the thing about rifles, so we're, we're rifles and shotguns compared to handguns, is they are much easier to shoot accurately, especially at close distances, than say a handgun. And when you think about it, it's an issue of kind of natural pointing and support. Like a rifle, you know, has four points of contact or shotgun with your body if you're holding it normally, your shoulder, your yeah. cheek, and uh, both hands. Right? It's kind of anchored to you. So. Mm -hmm. You know, where you're pointing it is where things are going to go. Well, I just want to ask, is there anything we're missing that stands out to you with this ammo weapons? Because obviously we're, we don't know that much about weapons. I, I think and this is conjecture on my part, but everything I have heard so far it seems to indicate that, that all this happened at what I would describe as very close distances. Is, is that consistent with what you guys have uncovered throughout this? I would think so, at least relatively close, because it's also dark out. Let's say... Alec is walking Paul up and there's a guy person waiting for them. Alec is within three feet of Paul because he has possibly the high velocity spray. So let's say he's three feet away from Paul. Can he be sure if you're the guy shoot, if you're the shooter, can you be pretty sure you're going to only hit Paul and not hit Alec? Is that a hard, that's what I'm trying to say. Is that a hard shot if you're 10 feet away or whatever? I would not classify that as a, a hard shot at all for okay. either okay. of the, the weapons involved. Now, again, gotcha, that, gotcha, that gotcha. doesn't count doesn't account for stress factors. So, yeah, and we don't know that he was definitely three feet apart. No, he could have been closer. So we we right. don't know the answer. We yeah. just know he yeah. couldn't have been more than three feet away. It's just reasonable if let's say he's they're walking up the path. It's reasonable that a guy holding a shotgun could hit the person he wants to hit from yes. 10 feet yeah. out or whatever yeah okay that's that makes sense now you got anything else for tom i think we covered it tom thanks man i appreciate it very much no no problem at all my pleasure you have a great thank day thank you for taking time
Okay, you Bye. too. We said we would talk about some theories we have been sent, whether on Facebook message or just on our Facebook page, which is Murdoch Podcast. And we also have MurdochPodcast.com and Matt Harris Podcast at gmail.com. So start us off, Seton. So we have Nina who wrote a really long theory and she has some really great points. One of the points she made was about divorce. That was a lot of people see that as a potential motive. Um, and some of the things that have been reported about Maggie seeking a counsel and, you know, reports also about money and a balanced charity check. She also thinks that Maggie saw her killer and ran, and that may be why she was shot in the back. Hmm. And in her opinion, she thought it looked more like a gang style hit and that maybe Paul was a casualty. A lot of people think that maybe Paul was in the wrong place at the wrong time and also vice versa. They go back and forth where people are saying the real target was Paul. Then other one will say the real target was Maggie. So that that has been tossed around a lot. And one of the things that she also pointed out that I thought was super interesting was she thought that maybe Alec was trying to wrestle the gun away from Paul. And that could be a reason that he received the high impact spatter. Hmm. Do you have another one for us? Yeah, I have a few other ones. Kimberly sent also her theory. And one of the things I've noticed that she said that she thought it looked like a cartel style hit, which it did seem kind of calculated. And she said maybe Paul was involved in some of these dealings that Alec was involved with. And maybe that could have been why he was killed. I've got one from Henry. It uh, says, you and Seton may have forgotten, but what was the weather the night of the murders? It was raining off and on. Raindrops fall at speeds of 15 to 25 miles per hour. I looked it up, of course. Is it possible that falling raindrops hitting the oozing blood caused what some could interpret as high-velocity impact spatter? Remember that blood spatter analysis is not an exact science. Could weak spatter from raindrops into blood at six inches look like spatter caused by a gunshot impact from three feet away? So let's talk about that rain because I sent former FBI agent Bobby Chacon a question about the rain. He said... Rain would not have a significant impact on the high-velocity spatter because the nature of that spatter is such that the velocity causes the molecules of the substance to be basically embedded into the microfibers of the clothing such that it isn't really going to be washed out with being, without being soaked, submerged for a significant period of time. Even then, the spatter is still going to be there. They could do a caustic agent to try to get that out, but that would degrade the fibers, and you would know that would happen. case of intermittent or even steady rain would not be degrading to the impact spatter. This is what separates high-velocity spatter from other more common blood stains. And since the significant spatter is on a living person in this case, we can assume that he covered up or got out of the rain as much as possible. He's basically saying rain doesn't have a ton of effect. Yeah, I've seen a lot of chatter about the rain possibly being involved in some way. So that's really interesting what Bobby Chacon says. Another one, actually, Ariel says, I don't have a theory that doesn't involve Alec. I just don't see it. We've gotten a lot of that. And I think, you know, we know that maybe he wasn't truthful about not being there if he did receive this high impact spatter on him. Yeah, I got an email. She says, her theory is we think Maggie was threatening to divorce Alex. They couldn't risk the scrutiny that a divorce would bring to his carefully constructed world of crime. Alex was at Moselle when she arrived. He walked her into the kill zone, perhaps in the pretense of talking things over or looking at something outside. Maggie spotted the hired killer and ran screaming. We don't think Paul was supposed to be there. How to account for the shotgun being used to kill Paul? We think it's likely the first shooter and an accomplice who either wrestled the gun away from Paul or more likely grabbed what was at hand. Alec uh, exercised poor judgment in hiring these assassins. Maggie and Paul are most likely killed by younger guys with gang connections. And the blood spatter? We think Alec stood close enough to Paul, possibly trying to calm him down, that he ended up with some of the son's blood on the clothing. Thanks for a fabulous podcast, says Sally. So Meredith says on our Facebook page, she says, One of the main things Chacon said that stood out to me was how difficult it would have been for an individual to use shooter weapons, long guns, to fire and only be a yard from the victim. It sounds like he's implying Alex or someone else was hiding somewhere around the kennels. I do think Alex laid in wait for Maggie and shot her first from a distance and then perhaps administered a kill shot at close range. Paul is a little bit more questionable. With two different types of ammo in the shotgun, I don't think it was used for a premeditated plan. Maggie was the target and Paul was not supposed to be there. Perhaps he witnessed something from the kennels. If his death was unplanned, I wonder if Alex and an accomplice were surprised by him and the accomplice did the shooting. 
It sounds like the blood spatter would have had to belong to Paul since Maggie was shot in the back and then in the back of the head while down. Blood spatter velocity would be carried to the ground. I thought that one had some really good and interesting points. Well, thank you for your emails and thoughts. And as we get them, we will handle them the best we can in our uh, next episodes. Thanks to Betty, who sent a note, says, I really enjoy this podcast, especially as Matt Seaton and their guests are unbiased. Being able to hear the information and form our own opinions is fantastic. Reach out to us. Tell them again, Seaton. You can reach out to us on our Facebook page, which is Murdoch Podcast, or on our website, which is MurdochPodcast.com. Please take the time to rate and share the episode. We're so grateful every time anybody listens. We'll talk to you soon.